pod where we dive into the vibrant world of art through chatting to amazing artists about their life and their work. I'm Sarah Hodgkins, I'm the muralist at Charlotte Designs and now a podcaster. Today my guest is the wonderful Kat Croxford who is an expressive landscape painter working in Buckinghamshire. Welcome Kat and thank you for being here. Oh hi Sarah, I'm really chuffed that you asked me and uh, I'm very excited about today. So Good, well, I'm excited too, I think we've got a lot to talk about, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> um, bit of background, I met Kat a few years ago on the set of Landscape Artist of the Year, I'll just pick that name up shall I? Um, I wanted to, I want to talk more about that later because obviously there is further developments on that, uh, but in doing my research for this podcast, I have realised one very important thing that I didn't know about you. Your painting trousers. Do you, <laughs> wipe your brush, do you wipe your brushes on them as well, just like I do? Because they look exactly the same as mine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, they're closer than the paint pot. They're closer. It's so much easier, isn't it? I mean, and I actually wipe on my shoulders, my belly, whatever's going. Same. Here, it's it's here. I, I do it here. That's yes. no good on yeah. cast, is it? <laughs> above, above the right breast is my kind of uh, uh, wiping place. Honestly, it's a very bad habit, and I have had clients tell me off about it. But it, I just smiled when I saw that picture. Uh, and I was like, honestly, I did. I did a workshop last week and uh, someone actually thought that they were a patterned trouser. They didn't, they didn't realise that know. they were actually you know, just a work of art in their own, obviously. But um, crazy, yeah, they got it. Maybe that's a, a, an outlet for us, should we ever require one. I, I think so. You know, complete fashion design. Everyone's going to wear one. Mind. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Um, I'd like to start off by just talking a little bit about your background. Um, I think it's really interesting to understand how people's upbringing has kind of led them to, to where they are now. Now, interestingly, you grew up, it seems, in a family of artists. I, now, I did. I, I, I'm dying to know what that's like, because obviously my poor children, I do do worry about them all the time. <laughs> well, it's brilliant, and your children are very lucky. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my um, yeah, my mum uh, was an artist, um, and uh, and my brother, who's younger than me, he just used to look himself in his room and just draw for hours. The huge sort of um, scenes of war, <laughs> lots of soldiers. Wow. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'd come home, and mum would have created a whole load of paintings, and there'd be paint all over the carpet. So she'd be quickly cutting the paint out of the carpet before my stepdad got home. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so it was always just a, a natural thing that we did. You know, we, we all drew, we all painted, um, we all got messy. And uh, and, and actually, funny enough, mum used to do lots of murals as well. She's just around the house. Oh, I didn't We'd come that. home and there'd be something completely different <laughs> on the walls. Now, we lived in rented houses most of the time. So ah. she, she left them every time we moved, but um, it's a gift. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. Gift. How she, fantastic! She, she was an intense artist. Uh, yeah, she was, and actually, it, it's thanks to her really that um, that I paint. Um, you know, it, it, if if it hadn't really been for her, she started a wonderful business um, called Joe Daisy Studio, where uh, we okay. taught people how to paint. Um, and uh, and that sort of was that allowed me to concentrate on teaching and painting, um, and uh, yeah, and then sort of find my own teaching, uh, find my own painting voice um, from yeah, that. Yeah, fantastic. So growing up with uh, with a creative mum, how how did that affect your, uh, I suppose your the beginning of your art, art, art creativity? I I always worry that there's pressure on kids of artists to be creative and, and whether that can sometimes be a, a bad thing as well as a good thing. How do you feel it helped or indeed not uh, you in the early days? Well, yes, of course, because to rebel is to, uh, well, is, to is to not be creative. And, and I guess actually that's what I did. So um, I ended up actually not going to art school it, all I wanted to be actually was a was a pure artist and my school sort of more encouraged people to be uh, graphic designers and architects and I wasn't really uh, feeling that and I just thought you know what um, 
I've watched my mum struggle all these years as a struggling artist. I think it's probably good if I make a pragmatic decision and uh, and go into um, finance. <laughs> so actually, I did no, something completely you... different. <laughs> See, that was my next question. What were you doing in the corporate world of finance? You see, I would never have guessed that in a million years. I tell you, I love, I love numbers. I love order. And, and actually, my roles within, uh, I sort of worked in financial services. I also worked uh-huh. in um, consultancy businesses. But normally I was training um, people um, and also working in the glamorous world of compliance, which is all about checking and dotting I's and crossing T's. And honestly, I, I get a real... I get a real kick out of that sort of detail <laughs> analysis, which you is. Are, which I is was going to say, you are a rare beast, Cat Croxford, because there aren't <laughs> many artists who love numbers. I mean, I can't bear them. In fact, oh. I would say I'm number dyslexic to a point. Oh, I, I love them. I love the beauty of maths. It's a whole art. It is another, you know, artistry. Wow. Um, and I see, and, and actually, this is what. Uh, stood me apart from my mum. My mum was a, a totally emotional abstract painter. Um, uh, I mean, she did some treescapes as well, but she really developed into a very sort of, um, really sort of painted with her heart. Whereas I am more of a draftsman, I think, and I end up being a little bit more ordered and analytical. Um, so I think that's where we sort of diversified or, you know, created our own. I, we're, we're different, very, very different artists, even though same family and you know, uh, sort of same job wow. in the end. Yeah. 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 How interesting. So, so what was the catalyst? What, what took you out of finance and into art as a full-time career? Was there a particular event? Yeah. So um, it was, I, I was working in quite a high pressure job in um, the glamorous world of telecoms. And my mum was uh, running Joe Daisy studio, this amazing thing that she created from nothing, just, uh, teaching people and running a, a, a lovely studio in South Oxfordshire and I started to help out with some teaching um, and then I thought you know what, I'll just give working a break and I'll just you know immerse myself in art for a few months um, and that was oh god that was what 16 years ago I, I never went back to the corporate world and I just just immersed myself in painting and teaching and um, and actually, the teaching was what I was doing more of. And then in the last sort of 10 years, I started to do less teaching and started to develop my own practice more uh, and then and then find myself here. That's a really interesting story. And how how do you feel your career in the corporate world has helped you now as a, a as a practicing artist? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it has, but I suppose it must have done. I guess dealing with people um, yeah. as artists, we can become very insular. Um, so uh, building communities, talking to people, um, I think. And, and also, as you know, as every artist has to be that you have to be a business person as well mm-hmm. so you you have to look at your numbers and, uh, yes, you true. um you have to be strategic um I make sure every year I sit down and plan you know what my goals are for the year um and I think that discipline was born out of working in corporate world um and you know I often look at my business in quarters you know so and do quarterly reviews so I think oh, interesting some of that side um, has definitely leaked over from from corporate and that sort of desire to be uh, really professional because people are mm. you know investing their money into your work. So Absolutely true. you want to make sure there's a really good professional edge that they have the confidence in you that you know what you're doing um, and that you're someone that they can invest in. Do you know, and I think that's so true. I think what a lot of artists forget is it, it doesn't matter how good you are at what you do that unless you have that grounding in business skills uh, from wherever that comes from, yeah. it's really, yeah. really difficult to make a, a, a sensible living from it. I, I think so. I think, and there, there are more and more resources out there, I think, to help um, artists Definitely. start up. And I mean, and this podcast, Sarah, I think is, is a genius thing to do because it's going to give people who are just beginning, you know, a, 
you know an insight into to what you know they have to do and how to create a, a good business because it, you know like we both know unfortunately it's not just a case of paint it and they will come no. <laughs> you have to really no, really, really hustle <laughs> and actually yeah. oh, oh, sorry all I was going to say was um oh, no. the, the the, uh, covid and the pandemic really taught me how to hustle as well really to how to i don't know whether hustle is the right word but to be to 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 be more um it, have more of a marketing um edge think actually yeah. about what i'm saying what i'm communicating not just with my paintings but how i talk to my hopefully my prospective buyers and and uh, and that helped me that helped me definitely gave me some time to think about that yeah, that's really interesting. And I think when you said about uh, what the, you, your job in finance has given you now, if I was in sales for many years and I still have a sales board on my wall, that's so ingrained in how I operate. I Brilliant. have a sales board. On... So, as it were, in order to know what, what, what it is that you can achieve and what you can do. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. OK, I want to talk more now about your creative process. I'm very interested in everyone's creative processes. You know, we've mentioned uh, landscape artists just watching those. Well, it's eight people in a pod now and how different everyone's process is. It's very, very interesting. Now, you're best known for your tree pictures, your lovely expressive sort of brush stroke. I don't know. Does that have a does it have a name? Does it have a proper name? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I've had I've, several it's people have called it several different things. <laughs> not yeah, yeah, not we, all of them particularly. Uh, I'm not going to use. We them don't yet. need to label it. No, <laughs> we don't need to label it. That's absolutely fun. Um, but I also noticed on your website that you have some very very detailed floral pieces on there which are quite a different style and I'm interested as to which, which is your style what style do you feel most connected to um so they sort of feel like the same style to me and I know I know they don't look the same at all no, but at um all. The idea, so someone, yeah, someone said to me once, you know, you paint in all these little squares. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> really? Do I? <laughs> and then I look, I'm like, oh, yeah. So it's not a conscious thing. It just happens to be the brush I use. That's that's what I think. And I, all I'm all I'm thinking is, how do I break up colour? How do I break up form? You know, that's what's driving me. So when I'm doing um, the florals, I think, how can I break up this colour? So all I'll do, because it, it tends to be smaller marks than, than yes, foliage, yes. Um, is I'll angle the brush in a slightly different way. But actually, I still, I'm still using the same brain. I'm still using the same bit of my brain to think, how can I make a series of small marks when you step back imply something else? Um, now, obviously, the, the florals are more detailed and they do take yes. longer and the marks are, are smaller, but it still feels oh, a similar process, even though the, the, the sort of ultimate um, image is, is actually quite different. And do you prefer doing one to the other? Um, I prefer doing the trees. <laughs> actually, no. it, it, it's I, I've moved on. I love doing the florals. Um but they, they, because they are more detailed, they take me longer um, and uh, they can be um, a bit frustrating as well. Okay. Um, uh, so I haven't done, I haven't done any florals for a few months now, actually. So okay. I'm so, I'm so focused on the trees. I'm not on doing the them so much. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, no, that makes perfect sense to me. It makes perfect sense. So. When you wake up in the morning, how do you decide what you're going to paint today? Do you have, because, you know, we've already mentioned you're quite an organised person, quite a, um, I don't know, you like things in a certain Systematic. way. Systematic, yeah. Systematic, great word. That's a very good word. <laughs> so do you know what you're painting? Do you know what you're painting today, next week, next month? Or are you very much a whatever takes your fancy that morning? Um, I, I think uh, a little bit of both, but probably a bit more about the planning. So... This okay. time of year is is super busy. So I've got um, exhibitions. I've got one starting tomorrow, actually. I've got um, two art fairs. I've got another exhibition and then an open studio is all before May. So I have to plan it all out. So I 
plan out um, what sizes I'm going to do mm-hmm. and uh, approximately what week I'm going to do that size. And it, it gives me a framework um, so I can monitor and make sure I'm not going to end up with one week to go and have to panic. And, you know, I, I'm never going to paint enough paintings under panic mode. They just, if I do, they're no. going to be rubbish. No, you know, you've got to, got to feel it. So I will, I will have the shape or the size planned. Um, the subject matter is normally just there because I would have, I, I have to plan that as well. I plan um, going out into the woods in autumn, early spring, you know, whenever the light's good, I, I try and plan days where I'm in the woods taking lots of photographs. Uh, right. So I always have a resource of material. And um, and then sort of I work that week based on my plans, but also based on how I'm feeling. So yeah. if, for example, you know, I've got to do some small 60 by 60s and I'm feeling in a really big mood, then I'll yes. bump it. You know, I'll, 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 60 by 60 yeah. canvas out the window. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So um yeah so I'll 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 move things around but at least I, I I know what my plans are so if I bump something it gets done at a later date or if I'm bringing something forward so that's that's roughly um how I work um what it means though is I certainly this time of year I don't have much time to play um right. or take risks which I miss but um I, I know I'll have to mail that to do that yeah yeah um I think it's such an important part of an artist's tool bag is is that time to play that time to experiment and I think if you don't get that it can start to feel it is I certainly feel like I'm caged I'm boxed I I kind of feel like I'm not uh, I feel like I want to break out you know definitely um, incredible Hulk thing um (laughs) without the turning green um so uh, you, you sound like you you are the same. You need that kind of uh, time to. I don't know. Yeah. It's fill up the cup in a way. I, I I mean I don't know about you, but if I'm if I'm forcing myself to do something, I don't paint very well. Mm, um, same. It, yeah, it it doesn't doesn't feel right, does it? So no. you can put as many plans in place, but if it's not if it's not there for you, and or if you're putting yourself under pressure, or you feel like you're in that box, then you, you're not going to paint very well. And sometimes I don't know I'm painting very well. I'm not painting very well. It's about halfway through, and in fact, there's a painting I've just destroyed, actually, oh, really? that I've already spent three days on, and it's knowing when to leave the table. And I'm like, yeah, do you know what? This isn't this isn't going to work. This is this isn't going to work. And I've, it's been liberating completely covering it over with black and starting again. Um, but I was forcing it, you know, there's that pressure yeah. um, to, to get it done. So I'm, I'm glad you're the same. Cause I think, I think you have to be in the zone, don't you? You have to feel it. Definitely. And it took me quite a long time, I think, to, to realize that. And I, I, I know certainly in the early days, I took on projects that I probably shouldn't have taken on because they didn't excite me. Um, yeah. And now I'm much more selective. And if I do a project, it's because I want to do it and that I'm feeling excited by the prospect. And, you know, that that it, it makes such a massive difference to the quality of work that you produce. It, it really does. And it's but it's also a point of success, isn't it? So I think, you know, we, we all take on stuff maybe that we wouldn't have normally. I can certainly think of some commissions I would say no to now because, it, you That's know, right. you're starting out on this career. You've got to, you know, keep yourself in in wine and food wine biscuits <laughs> yeah biscuits yeah Costas. Um, yeah. so I think as you get as you get more successful and certainly more well known but or, or you create more of a bigger body of work particularly with commissions people can see what you what you do and it's easier to um yeah to be to be selective and choose the projects that you know that are going to excite you yeah definitely, definitely. now This might sound like an odd question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, It is a completely genuine question. And that is, and I'm thinking about the tree paintings now. How do you stop them from looking samey? Because they don't look samey. They all have their own personalities, but yet they're all trees. They're mostly all woodland. How, How do you get them looking so individual and so different? 
Wow. Well, uh, that's well, that's an amazing thing to say about them. Thanks, Sarah. I'm I'm really chuffed about that's that. True. Um yeah, do you know what? And sometimes I get to the point where I think I've done them all. I've done all the tree scenes I, I've got in me. I, I, they're all, you know, I'm going to start repeating. But um, it's because um, it's because I take my inspiration uh, directly from real life. So yeah. um, and nature is chaos, and yes. nature is is wonderful. And um, even the same tree, even the same three or four trees, each season will look different and each year will look different and each different True. time of the day will look different. So um, so that's, that's probably why. So I, I don't tend to paint the same scene, the same scene twice, or at least from the same photograph, but okay. I might paint the same area a couple of times, it, sometimes unknowingly. Um, but I think, um, I think, yeah, I think it's because of taking it from real life. It helps, it helps it to feel different, um, mm. and and yeah. So each scene is is so unique um, because of that. That you, in fact, actually, this is one of the things I love about the tree scenes, or actually any landscape, is that you're capturing that moment in time that's never going to exist again, and and you're you're a magician putting it onto the canvas. You know, it's just just this this wonderful, you know, sort of capturing of, of something, you know, of, of, of maybe a memory and, and maybe a, you know, a, a sort of a, just a turn of the earth, whatever it is, a rise of the sun. Um, yeah. And it, it makes it, it makes that unique. And I think as long as I keep doing that, um, then they'll continue um, hopefully to look very unique and different Good. from each other. Good. Well, long may that continue. And I think, there is almost a um, a coming together. I think, you know, you're absolutely right. It is about capturing a moment. But as you say, it's the time of year, the time of day. It's you being there and being able to capture it. It's you being at the right angle. There's a lot of things that have to happen that have to, to, to make that perfect moment. And then yeah. you have to reproduce it. So it's... If you think about it, every painting is is almost a miracle in itself. In that, you, know, I, you wonder I, how on earth it's got there. I, 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 I agree, and actually, this is one of the things I say to my students. You know, because there's always that fear at the you know the beginning. You know, particularly if you if you're new to painting or you haven't painted something like this before. And I always say to my students, you know, you're going to create something unique. Whatever happens, you know, it's an expression of you, even if you don't like it at the end or it isn't what you thought it was going to look like. You know, it, the actual practice of creating that painting is also capturing that unique moment as well of this interaction with you as a vital human being, um, uh, you know, sort of expressing on the canvas. Um, however it comes out, you have brought into existence something that never existed before. It's, it's a wonderful thing to do. It is. We are very lucky, aren't we? We are. We are lucky. extremely lucky. I love I my have, job. It's not yeah, a job. Me too. I have to remind myself of that sometimes. We are very, very fortunate. Um, how do you know when a painting's finished? Because I would have thought with a style like yours, it can be quite tempting to just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Another thing I say to my students is be a lazy painter. See what you can get away with. So it, it, Interesting. It, the point being, you know, don't um, keep stepping back from the canvas. Um, see what illusions you can create with this, with a few amount of marks as possible. So I try and use that philosophy in finishing a painting. So uh, I think I, I don't think I, I, I think it was somebody who said this to me, which it, no painting is finished; it's just abandoned. And I really <laughs> love that. <laughs> That I love abandoning it and just going, right, yeah, that's done, that's done. And then make it a stranger, so leave it for two or three days yes, and then I let it that. and let it just jump up in front of you. And then you'll be like, oh, God, no, that tree looks ridiculous. Or, yep. or you know, something will be really obvious or maybe the paint is a bit thin or something like that. Um, but, yeah, abandon your painting. Be lazy about it. Go, yeah, it's probably done. <laughs> and that's the best yeah. way I can think of. No, and I, I do agree with that. I often leave things on the easel for weeks, sometimes even months, and just yeah. live with it and, and see what I like and what I don't like. And as you say, something will jump out and grab me and, and make me want to rework it, or it's done, or it's yeah. in the bin. 
or it's in the bin. No, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, sometimes it's a case of, you know, sometimes you get really attached to something and you can't sit, you can't see the wood for the trees. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, sorry about that. But sometimes you can't see actually that it's not very good. You know, you, you sort of have an inkling. I'll get attached to something and I'll be like, yeah, there's something wrong with it. Um, and then, like I said, that's when you have to cut ties with it, hide it mm -hmm. and then go back to it later. Which brings me quite neatly on to how, where do you go for feedback and how do you incorporate feedback into your creative process? Um, so it used to be my mum. My, my first feedback loop was my mum. And uh, generally, That's whatever she said, I'd do the opposite. No, <laughs> mums and daughters. Uh, no, so um, <laughs> she would laugh at that. Um, but I mean, I obviously I, I knew my mum very well. So if uh, and I knew her, I knew her painting language very well. Mm -hmm. So I sure. wouldn't necessarily do what she suggested, but I'd get a feeling, um, you know, from her. Um, and the other person I ask is my partner. Actually, um, he's he's brilliant. He, he, he's really good, and and he's 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 pretty brutal. <laughs> In a good way, you know. He's not just going to say, "Oh, yeah, that's lovely, darling." You know, well done. You he'll, need he'll that. say, "Yeah, absolutely, absolutely." You need someone to. Sometimes he doesn't say anything; you just see it on his face. Um, uh, that's but the I worst. can't. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> it's face all like, yeah. Just spent four days on a painting, um, but but I override everything. So if he doesn't like something, and I absolutely love it, I'm like, "Yeah, no, he's wrong." Um, but if I'm fee if I'm asking for his help, then I know something's not quite right. So he's not an artist either. Um, so no, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, he, he's just he just says I just want to be able to walk into them. If I can't walk into them, I'm not interested. <laughs> so uh, I know what his you know his aim is. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that, that's that's my feedback loop. Really, it's difficult actually because. Um, I, I so my mum my mum died about 18 months ago so I miss her input um I'm a lot uh yeah she was a she was a force of nature so that that's that's difficult um so I definitely am lacking more of that loop um and I think this is where you go to the community as well yes where you talk to other artists maybe not specifically about one particular painting but perhaps you know, comparing ideas about mm -hmm. process, even just state of mind or, 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 you know, some of the things that we do that we're chatting about here. You know, I think that is a, is a good feed lap loop, feedback loop, even if it isn't just about specific painting. It just gives you that reassurance that, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll keep yeah. going. I'll hold my own. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I'm feeling confident. You know, that's I think that's where it's useful to reach out to your community. Yeah, no, definitely. I can I completely agree. And I think. The trick is just to not take it to heart too much and to remember that you're not painting for that community, you're painting for you. So yeah, um, you're you're dead right. Yeah. I, and and that's really important because you've got to love it. Um it doesn't yeah. matter if no one else it doesn't really matter if no, no. one else likes it. And I've got paintings that I love and they've never sold, and I cannot understand it. But you know, I'm not and in fact, actually sometimes it's good to get negative feedback. Because it tests how tests your strength of convictions about what you're doing. Yeah. Because you, yeah, you've definitely. got to have a strong idea about how you work, and you've got to feel confident in it. Because you have to be mm -hmm. able to bat away, you know, the, the, the bad comments, which we all get. So yeah, uh, and being an artist is about questioning. It's about questioning yeah. of ourselves and asking questions of our audience. So yeah. for me, having that negative feedback is almost a part of the process in that yeah. you've got to, got to know it, when to take it on board and know when to ignore it and, and plow on because you've got that vision of, of what you're trying to achieve. Definitely. It's a, it's a real conversation, isn't it? And I, and I think it, whether it's good or bad, and again, something my mum used to say, if someone walked past her work and didn't say anything, she felt like she'd failed. You know, she, it, it, oh, to really? her, absolutely, it was all about, um, you know, creating a reaction. In fact, actually, the one behind me, I know we're on a podcast, we'll be able to see it. I was going to ask um, you about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so she would, you know, create work. And again, she wouldn't create work too 
stimulate um you know people you wouldn't we like we said before we don't tend to create work in order to get a reaction as it were it's not about other people but if if your work is just being ignored and you're not you're not inspiring yes. a conversation then you've got to think about what it is that you're doing and why and why you're doing it absolutely yes yeah. that's, that's the important question um, I've just got one more question about the sort of creative process, and and that is about your your use of colour. When I look at your paintings, it, they are yummy. They are just. I mean, I almost want to eat them. They are <gasps> just. I feel the same. I, the food and paint is the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> the colour palettes are just yum. How Thank do you. you approach your paintings and approach the colour palettes that you use? Again, is, does the planning side come out? Are you planning what colours you're going to use? No, you're, you're no. shaking your head. So yeah, tell no, me. And, and, <laughs> I, I, I wing it. I wing it. Um, so again, I start. I start the painting. I, I mean, I know my colours really well, and I, I have every single colour. <laughs> So uh, one of my favourite. Do you use them all? Text. No, no, I ah, don't. Ah. I know, I know. So I, I, I feel a bit sad for them actually because they're sat there. There's a whole range sat there, just all lonely. There's a one colour. It's um, oh, I think it's called Farlo Turquoise. I, I anyway, I loved it about five years ago, and I bought a load of it and <laughs> never used it since. So. Um, but I mean, because I work in acrylic, I do have a lot of colours because I don't want to do any pre-mixing. I want to, no. I want to mix on the canvas, and I think about it as speaking a language. So I'm really familiar with some of my pigments, some of the words. You know, I know how they're going to fit together. I know how they're going to mix. I know how they're going to look. Um, so there's probably um, uh, a core of eight to fifteen colours that I always okay. rely on. Okay, um, we touched a little bit about uh, the sort of commercial side of your business, um, but I want to just talk a little bit more and go into a little bit more detail about that if I can. So um, talk to me a little about pricing. This is the, the art, I know it's the artist's nemesis, um, <laughs> yes. but it's such an important topic. There isn't, yeah. or there are very few other careers where you're selling gosh we're selling part of our soul for goodness sake we are so the value of it is not just the price of the canvas and the paints and even just our time there is more to it than that tell me about how you approach pricing and how you come up with you know do you have a set pricing structure I do I do have a set pricing structure and actually um I was really lucky early on in my treescape painting. I was taken on by Clifton Fine Art in Bristol, and they really helped me. They really helped oh. with my pricing. They uh, they almost immediately put my prices up. I've been with them for about five five or six years, um, and um, <clears throat> so they really help, um, uh, which is great. Uh, so they help with a bit of advice um, and also. Um, yeah, it's it's you know it's good to have somebody else to say well actually you know because of this because of that they should be more more money because it's very difficult I think as an artist to value yourself you know a, a, a good good level because you tend to go well I can't believe someone wants my work <laughs> I mean early days early early days um, when I first started you know teaching and I would exchange it for chocolate or wine <laughs> you know I'd be like oh you love my painting oh, I'll just have a bottle of wine. Have it, have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have it. You love it, have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So, uh, so Clifton helped me be a bit more professional about that. And then, um, as as time has gone on, you know, um, I have most of my canvases handmade. Um, I now probably spend where I might have spent one day on a painting. I tend to spend three, um, okay. three or four. <clears throat> so definitely the investment of my time and my own money, or you know, my expenses. Yes. Uh, at, at a point where you have to go look come on let's just be serious about this you know th this is what you've paid you know all your other expenses and uh mr taxman and all of that you've got to make sure that it, this is um this is sensible but similarly um you obviously have to appeal to you know the market that you want to sell to as well so um it is it is a it is a balance isn't it it's it's uh 
Yeah, it's a tricky. It's a really tricky area, and and I, I basically my depending on the size that you know my price is all um, you know um, standardized over um, sizes, so that sort of helps as well. And you do um, you do prints, and I also noticed, and I didn't know this until again I did the research this week. Is you do um, I saw a printed scarf, a silk scarf. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I was like, why am I not doing this? <laughs> Honestly, I got really excited about that a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, uh, because, well, you know, I'm sort of, again, I'm, I'm planning strategically. I, I don't intend to ever not be able to paint. You know, I, I, I'm never going to retire. I'm always going to paint. But it would be good to have that core uh, item like prints or something that makes sure that you're paying the electricity bill you know so you, yeah. you're not at the whims exactly. of you know of, uh, of whether you can get out to galleries or, or that sort of thing um and with my florals which we mentioned earlier they don't sell that well they're not i think because of the black background I'm, I'm not sure why they just don't sell that no. well so i thought well how else because i love doing them and so what else can i do with them so i started having silk scarves made <laughs> And uh, and it's an investment. That it's not cheap to do that. No, I um, bet. It's there's a wonderful place that I used in Macclesfield, so it's one of the last sort of uh, British places. It, it, and that print on um, on the silk, the silk still from China because we don't we don't no, create no, enough silk in this country really commercially. Yeah. Um, but again, that required an awful lot of investment in marketing and um, you know and time and. Actually, at the same time, that's when my mum passed away. So I lost all the momentum for gotcha. doing the scarves. And they've taken a bit of a backseat until I'm... Because okay. I, I wanted to go into sarongs and, you know, caftans and everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I can see your work. Your work will, will lends itself to that. I mean, the trees as well as the florals, to be perfectly honest. I, I, can, I can see myself in a, in a scarf. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm on board with that. <laughs> I, I I'm definitely I'm definitely going to return to it. I, I was really passionate about it. I've got all these different colourways, you know. Um, like I said, I'd planned on some caftans and you know some sort of things that I would like to wear. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it's energy and focus. I've just yeah, uh, absolutely. I don't have enough of either. <laughs> no, 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 no. To return to that at the moment, and actually, even the prints. I'm not doing any more prints for a while either. Um, oh, I've okay. always been 50-50. I mean, Sarah, do you do prints? I mean, I don't no, know how I feel no. about them. I feel it's something I should do. <laughs> should never say that, should you? But no, no. I, I, to this point, no. Yeah. That's the short answer to that question. Yeah, I, I, I was always a bit... Um, I've always a bit, I like my paintings to exist as that painting and not as anything yeah. else. That, But then I also quite like the idea of having that, having a lower cost way into the painting, getting, it you know, acquiring painting. It, it, it does, it really market. does. And, um, I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think yeah. there's probably an argument at the moment to say that it's good to have something at different price points. Absolutely. That, absolutely. Know, a wider range of people can, can access. Um, yeah, no, it, it's interesting. It, it's something I have toyed with um, and continue to, to toy with. But like you, it's it's all time. and Yeah. You know, you just can't do everything well so you've just got to concentrate on what's that absolutely and and um and if you spread yourself too thinly as well then um yeah then i think obviously that can be a problem in terms of energy and focus um and and also you know you you've got to sort of think about you've got to think about what it is that you that you are you know what you are trying to achieve um you know, because I know lots of lovely uh, successful artists have really good sort of like homeware ranges. They do, you know, yeah. sort of various and, and just and I love that idea. Um, but I not yet, not now. No, I, no. I don't think I've got the time or the energy and I just want it all to go into the pure art uh, of it. Yeah. Um, no, so, I do yeah. get that. I do get that. Um, I was going to ask you something then and it's completely gone out of my head. I know what I was going to ask you. <laughs> Courses. Now, we talked about painting courses at the beginning, um, because that's obviously what 
how you started really with your with your mum um yeah. and I was going to say to you did you want to promote your painting courses but I went on to your website they're all sold out I know, <laughs> I know I'm really lucky are you there's still a few places left <laughs> oh they are at the end of the year <laughs> yeah at the end of the year I think there's four places left on the, through, yeah. <laughs> Are you planning more for this year? Um, I, again, I keep toying with that. I was going to squeeze another one in March. This is back in December. I thought I could fit another one in. I'm so glad I didn't put another one on. Um, I'm so busy. Um, so uh, I, I I might put another one on at the end of the year. So I've tried to, the bulk of them are sort of in the summer because that's yeah. when the trees are less interesting. We yeah. don't have as many art fairs or selling opportunities. So um, and also the summer is lovely for people to come out and uh, do things Absolutely. like that. Um, so maybe maybe towards the end of the year um, and then uh, definitely more for next year. Um, but yeah, they, yeah, I sold out last year and I expect to sell out this year too. I'm very lucky I have access to a lot of wonderful students that used to come to our courses with mum at Joe Daisy Studio. So I have a lot of those people who still return um course after course oh, so uh, yeah really yeah it's great as well and I, I I teach in a studio that some of mum's students now run they have their own studio and there's a photo of mum up on the wall and all of her sayings and stuff so it's a real legacy that she left so it's great to still be able to do it and a lovely thing I was I was going to say how, do, how does it how much do you enjoy them but I can just tell from how you're talking that it's it's clearly there's quite an emotional connection to those courses predominantly through your mum I guess but you must yeah. enjoy you must enjoy the the, the process of um, enabling others to be as good artists as they can be I, I love it I, and I love telling people what to do <laughs> <laughs> I love it I'm so bossy it's great no <laughs> No, in all seriousness, I do. Um, I do love it. I love and, you know, my old corporate world, I, I used to train and give, you know, uh, uh, presentations and stuff. So I'm quite comfortable with an audience. Um, so I, I love it. I love teaching. I love seeing people um, create stuff that they never thought that they could do it. It's the it's the best feeling in the world. And I love sharing, you know, as much as I've learned. So, you know, I'm self-taught. Obviously, I, I grew up with my mum and my brother. and But everything I do, I, I learn myself through trial and error and research and, you know, whatever I could do. And I'm keen that I can shortcut that for people and, and share what I know and, and just, you know, get everyone excited about what they can actually achieve themselves. It's amazing. I, I love teaching. I love it. Love it. And do you think being a self-taught artist yourself has produced a different end product, if you like, than if you'd been to university and studied fine art? Um, I guess we'll never know, but I suspect well, we won't. probably. Yeah, I yeah. suspect probably. I think so. I don't know what that is, but um, I think it makes me a better teacher. And I certainly have made a point of really researching my art even mm. down to how pigments work um yeah, yeah. because I guess without having had that art education I've wanted to to do it myself you know I've wanted to find out things myself and like I say most of the time it's it's just trial and error and see what happens and there's so much information out there now it's actually relatively easy to find a video yeah. of just about any art related subject that you might want to study yeah it, it, it's great isn't it I mean it, 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 when I started well, when I started out uh, but there was you know the, the, the amount of information and like you say the instruction videos out there is so good you know that you can that you can sort of you know pick up on other people's uh, processes and techniques and and see what works and and also a lot of students say to me they just they don't know what to buy they don't know, no. you know what brush or what paint so you know yeah. that's uh, it's it's great to be able to influence people and help people like that as well good now we mentioned at the very beginning uh, about uh, landscape artist of the year it would be remiss of me not to uh revisit that topic um 
Kat and I actually met when we were both wildcard artists. What was, is it Wickham Park? Just outside. Uh, West Wickham Park. West Wickham, is it West Wickham? Wickham? Yeah, West Wickham. Yeah, um, that was a what? Was that? Year. Was that 2020? No, that was 20. When was it? Was that? either 2020 because so. it was during COVID. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. yeah. COVID. We were meant to be two meters apart, but I don't think anybody really. <laughs> And anyway. Do you remember they said? They, they, do you remember they said as well? Don't mention COVID if you're interviewed on the telly. Yes, they, yes. They, don't mention it. We're going to pretend it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, which which <laughs> suited me quite nicely, to be perfectly honest. So I yes. was quite happy with that. But yeah. the big news is that Cat made it into a pod this year. What? What? Which was just I was so delighted when I I heard that. Um, Tell me a little bit about the experience because I I just enjoy being a world card artist. To be perfectly honest, I absolutely was, loved it. I, I, I tell you, I, it was really good fun. Have you done it since, Sarah? Have you gone no, a wild card again? I've had several wild card um, opportunities, but they've yeah. either not worked for me timing wise, or I've just I don't know. They've just not worked. I'd like yeah. to get into a pod if I'm honest. Oh, well, you know, it's it's the thing, isn't it? I mean, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> I'm, so... I, actually missed, I actually missed the deadline last year. Don't laugh. Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Well, you've still got time now. <laughs> I know. So we're going to have another go this year. So, but tell me about the experience. Um, it was great. How, yeah. it? how different was it from being a wild card? Well, uh, do you know what? Thank God for the wild card experience, actually, because oh, really? I was so nervous when we did the wild card. I remember shaking. I mean, like, oh, it's ridiculous. So actually, I felt really relaxed, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be really easy. <laughs> I felt really relaxed on the day. Um, I was so excited. And I, we were really lucky that we had lovely other artists as well in the pods. Um, but it was it was surreal. It was really surreal because um, because obviously you see it on the telly and then you're there. And um, I, I don't know, it, in a way, you're, the competitive edge is at odds with being an artist. You know, mm -hmm. you, to paint in a competition like that feels like, because I'm highly competitive and I obviously, I definitely wanted to win, but I just felt like I don't paint a painting to win anything, you know? So no, it's, it's, a really, it's a really weird way of thinking. Um, Plus castles, oh my God, I'd never painted a castle before. I don't know where to start. So that was a bit like, ugh, where are the trees? Um, and yeah. also the, the I other thing I... I saw it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, like where are the trees? <laughs> <laughs> when they called me actually uh, and said um, that I'd been picked, um, I was in the back of a cab actually and I was screaming and I was listening to the cab driver was like what the hell is going on um, and I said no where where am I going she went Aberdeen I'm like Aberdeen <laughs> I thought it'd be like Wickham again or somewhere close um, so I did the research and realized there weren't any trees there at all so I knew what to expect but what what I didn't expect was the fact that the public are allowed to just walk past you all the time um and um my instinct is to turn around and talk to everybody talk. you know and 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 you, you under the time pressure you can't you have to keep painting and it feels really rude to not you know turn around mm. and but so you're constantly being watched um and i think if you'd asked me at the end of the day whether i'd ever do it again i'd have said no never it was too too hard uh too weird too competitive um but Given the months of reflection, uh, I'd definitely do it again. <laughs> I really, hey. really, yeah. I'm gonna, We're I'm gonna die again. Yeah, first, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to win it. I've got to keep doing till I win it. <laughs> right. Well, I am definitely going in for it this year. Absolutely. Do it. Do it. So, oh, we could be yes, pod buddies and everything. It'd be great, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I just, I just, I just want to get into a pod. I really want to get into a pod. Okay. Um, I. I think we have just about covered everything that I wanted to cover. Um, what else are we can we look forward to from Cat Croxford this year? Then what 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 else apart from the, the the courses which we've already talked about? What else is going on? Where can people go and see your work um, in the flesh this year? Um, so I'm um, I've got an exhibition in Caversham, which is just north of Reading at Caversham Picture Framers that starts tomorrow so um very excited about that i'm going to be at cheltenham fresh art fair as well oh, with really? um 
uh, with a, a, a collective called Wooden Wing, who have two other wonderful artists. So come along to that. And then I'm at Affordable Art Fair in Hampstead. I'm also um, running an exhibition, which I run um, with a friend of mine. We curate uh, a yearly annual exhibition in Henley-on-Thames. Um, and that's in April. So we invite artists to come in and uh, exhibit their work. Nice. So that's in its third year. Um, and then I'm also exhibiting in North Yorkshire towards the end of the year as well, which wow. is um new stomping ground for me. So, uh, so yeah. How so, well, um, so my friend Liz, Liz Harvey, who's also an artist, um, I run the uh, Henley exhibitions with her. She used to live in Reading. She now has moved to North Yorkshire. So, um ah. Uh, so we're both exhibiting together and hopefully wow. we're also going to be, well, we're also running some courses together up in North Yorkshire as well. And we're looking to uh, do some curated uh, exhibitions up there too, uh, it, to complement the ones that we do in Henley. Um, oh, so, yeah, busy, busy, busy. You, send her. <laughs> you are extremely busy as always. <gasps> I love it. Um, love it. Thank you so much, Kat, for being a guest today. It's been lovely to chat to you. You can find uh, Kat's work at catcroxford.com or on Instagram on, it's Croxford underscore artist, is that right? No, I'm not. Uh, it's Kat Croxford artist. Kat Croxford artist, I apologise. Kat Croxford artist. Go and look her up. Fantastic work. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Paint Pod. Please like, subscribe, etc., etc., etc. It all really helps. Until our next wander through this audio gallery of ideas and inspiration, thank you and goodbye.